Hello, we are back with another Love Offering Live interview, and this time my guest is Shirley Connor. Thank you so much for being here today, Shirley. Thanks for having me. So you are a believer, and you have been honest to say that you have struggled with alcoholism and codependency, but you are on the journey of recovery. So would you start from the very beginning, if you can, and just to give us an idea of where you came from. I am a Midwest girl. I grew up in Boomville, Missouri, and that's a town of about 8,000 people. And my father was a doctor of veterinary medicine, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And I'm the youngest of four girls. And from the outside looking in, we looked like a pretty well put together family. You know, we went to church every Sunday. And my father was a really well-respected person in the community. Um, he had a wonderful personality, and um, people loved to be around him. But as a family, we had a huge, huge family secret. And that secret was that my father was a raging alcoholic. And so that made for a very chaotic environment to grow up in. And so I learned a lot of people-pleasing behaviors, lots of things to not rock the boat. And I can remember when I um, met my husband and I told him, I said, hey, get me as far away from my family and I'll be just fine. And I believe that. Well, so if you would, would you fast forward a little bit to being a wife and a mother and tell us what life looked like then, but uh, going into, because you cracked open the door to temptation, how that opened to a very wide open door for you? Well, we moved from Missouri to Southern California when my oldest child was three months old. See, my husband uh, had just graduated from Bible college, and I had just graduated from nursing school. And so we really felt the call in our hearts to my husband to go to Talbot Theological Seminary in Southern California. And so my husband was a full-time seminary student and he had his first job as a youth pastor, and so he was a full-time pastor. And part of the deal of being the pastor at this church, it was located on a large city block. And we got to live in this little tiny church parsonage on the church grounds. And to do that, he had to also be the security guard. And so we, he made about $9,000 a year, and that's what we had to live on. But we lived in this tiny church parsonage, and so we had youth kids dropping in on us all the time, and it was just a crazy time of life. We'd left our families back in Missouri, and so here we were raising young kids, and um, I was new in my nursing career. And it was then, though, that I had a friend who um, was Italian, and she taught me how to begin cooking with wine. You know, and I just thought, that's no big deal. There's no harm in that. And so she taught me how to cook a good egg, uh, eggplant parmesan and homemade spaghetti sauce. And so we'd have these Italian meals. And if we're, you're going to have Italian meals, then you've got to have a glass of wine with dinner, too. And so my bottles of wine just got bigger and bigger. And I always had a hidden supply. And I was lying to my husband about how much I really was drinking. But it all started with just the belief that you're just cooking with wine. What's the harm in that? But I knew the harm in that because I'd seen what alcohol had done to my father. But I believed the lie, and I opened that door to that temptation, and it took me on a, on a wild ride. Well, part of that ride involved, you started to see that your life was being marked by insanity. You say that you were becoming depressed and even contemplated and attempted suicide. So would you walk us through that part of your story? Yeah, that's, that was a really, really dark time in my life. And as I said, I felt way overwhelmed uh, with everything that was going on in our home. And... Um, I just found myself depressed, you know, and I thought, I don't understand, you know, I have these three beautiful kids, I have a career, 
My husband has a career. You know, we've given our lives to the Lord. But I was depressed. You know, and I tried all these things to try to make it better. And so I tried scripture memory, and I tried more Bible studies. And then I tried going to counseling. But I tell you, one thing I didn't tell the counselor was my secret. I didn't tell him anything about my drinking. You know, that was my secret, and nobody was going to touch it. So I wasn't honest with the counselor. I went to some meetings. I went to these meetings that were called Adult Children of Alcoholics. I thought, well, that will fix me. But it didn't. And I just felt myself getting more and more depressed. Until finally, I told myself, you know what? Alan and the kids, your husband and the kids, they would be so much more better off without you. And so I can remember drinking that day, and I had an old bottle of pain pills, and I took all of them. And I remember laying there in bed, not able to move, and I just thought, surely you are a complete idiot. All you're going to do is you're going to wipe out your liver, and you're going to continue to live. And that was a really, really dark time in my life. So, so around that time, your husband then just said, I'm going to take the kids and leave for a while until you get help. So would you take us to when you actually went to the treatment center and what that time was like for you? Yeah, my husband had kind of made the decision um, that if nothing changes, nothing's going to change. And so he, he approached me one time and said, you know, surely unless you get some help, the kids and I are going to find another place to live. And before he put that to me, he had a lady that came from this treatment center who was doing some uh, publicity, and it had a Christian component to it. And since my husband was a pastor, she came to his office and told him about this treatment center that um, was for recovery, and it had a Christian component. And she says, I just want to share it with you because you might have someone in your congregation that might be struggling with an addiction. And the whole time she was talking to him, he was thinking about me. And so he had made arrangements for me to go into treatment. And so the day that he told me that, it wasn't an empty threat. I could tell by the resolve in his eye, he meant what he said, that if I didn't go in, then the kids and and he would live elsewhere. And so I consented, unwillingly, but I consented And I tell you, the first two weeks that I was in there, I was angry. I was angry. I was angry at the church for the demands that they had placed on our family. I was angry at my husband because he was a real workaholic for God. I was angry at my family of origin Because I thought, well, if I hadn't been raised like that, I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing now. And I had two older sisters that drank far more than I did. Why couldn't they become the alcoholic? Here I had made a commitment to Christ, and I found myself in a really broken, bankrupt, spiritually place. And I was mostly, though, angry at myself. I could not believe that I had fallen to this point. I was angry at myself because I knew that I was totally destroying my Christian witness. And I thought, man, God's probably done with me now. You know, surely I have been disqualified from the race that he had marked out for me to run. And so I was broken. But the first couple of weeks I was in there, though, I set about, you know, fix, manage, and control everything else but me. And so I set out to reform the treatment center. I wrote letters and and gave them to my husband. I wanted him to take them to the newspapers and to the TV stations and tell them what a horrible place this was that I was in. And I had petitions going, and I had other clients signing the petitions. And finally, the director of this about 100-bed facility pulled me into his office. I thought I'd been taken to the principal's office. But he pulled me in, and he says, 
what are you doing? What are you doing? You did not come here to reform a treatment center. You came here to look at your own stuff. And that got my attention. And one of the things they did for me there is that there was a pastor's wife who had been through treatment prior to me, and she had had a pill addiction. And so they made the arrangements for her to come and to share her story with me, and that was so powerful because I realized then that, you know, I'm not the only pastor's wife out there that's ever struggled. And her story gave me so much hope because she was just willing to share and be vulnerable with me. I gained hope from that. And I went into these um, therapy sessions, these group therapy sessions, and finally the walls of my denial began to come down. And they made the statement there that only one in ten usually make it. And I decided then that I wanted to be the one. So your recovery then after that was put to a very hard test. Would you tell us about the experience with your oldest son? That was a tough time. And I was about ten years into recovery. And um, God had relocated us from Missouri to New Mexico. And my son had just turned 13 years old. And we had only been there for about one month. And I can remember vividly that that was Labor Day weekend. And so we had taken some extra money out of the bank because after church was all done, we were planning to go on a family getaway. And so we had extra money in the house. And that particular Sunday morning, my husband got up, and he always gets up very early and um, he got up early to go over to the church and finish up, and um, he walked out of the house and realized our car was gone. And he came back in to the house, and he's, you know, trying to figure out what has happened. What's, where's our car? And he realized that all the money had been taken out of his wallet. And he came in to the bedroom, and he woke me up, and he says, Shirley, something's happened, and I'm not sure what. But our car is gone, and the money in my wallet is gone. And it took us just a few minutes to finally make it to our son's bedroom, and there was a note on the pillow. And it said, Dear Mom and Dad, please don't be angry with me forever. I had to go home. And so he had taken our dachshund, our dog, and he had gotten into the car. We didn't even know he could drive, and that's before the time of cell phones and GPS and all of that. He actually used a map. And he drove the car from New Mexico all the way back to Missouri. We didn't even know he could drive. So he had to go through the cities of Amarillo, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and Joplin. And as a mama, my heart was crushed because we didn't know exactly where he was until he got there. That was a lot of hours to sit and the unknown of where your child is. But that began the long road of about seven years of a really hard rebellion on his part. And I will tell you, I had a broken heart. My heart was breaking. I felt guilty because of my own addiction which set me up to be in a very codependent relationship with my son. I wanted to fix him. But I couldn't. I was powerless to do that. And so my recovery was put to a very, very hard test. And so I had to continue to work out my recovery. And one of the things that my recovery teaches me is that I have to do life on life's terms. And 
And that can be tough. I have to do life on life's terms and not as I would have it. And so my recovery was, was challenged. And so I spent a lot of time on my knees praying, God, please make up for the deficits in my parenting. But I'm here to tell you that I was able to make it through that turbulent time sober and in recovery. And so it's possible. Life happens. Life continues to happen in recovery. Speaking of recovery, you now serve in a ministry called Celebrate Recovery at your church. So what would you say to us about what Satan might want to use to harm you, but God used for good? Well, I will tell you, um, we serve a God who has a heart for the brokenhearted. We see in Isaiah 61 what his what his heart is, and his heart is to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to those who are held in captivity, to rescue those who are in darkness of prison. And I will tell you that I have been every one of those things due to an addiction. I've been brokenhearted. I've been held captive. And I've been in very dark places. In every one of those places, Satan really wanted to kill, steal, and destroy. And I really feel like he wanted to kill, steal, and destroy not only me, but also my husband's ministry. And I'm a firm believer that if Satan cannot get to the pastor in the pulpit, he's going to go through the family. And he went through me, and he went through our son. And the battle was real. And Satan wanted to totally destroy my life, my kid's life, my husband's ministry. But I am here to tell you that we have a God that can take every bit of our brokenness and he can make beautiful things out of them. And that is where Celebrate Recovery comes in. And right now, we, we um, are involved in a Celebrate Recovery at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. And I will tell you, it's a beautiful ministry. It's really where my passion is. It's where my cross intersects with the world. And God has given me a passion for broken people. And in Celebrate Recovery, some of the things that I get to do, you know, I, the statement was made, my recovery in, is enhanced by being able to give back. And in this mis- ministry, I'm able to give back. This is a ministry for people who struggle with hurts, habits, and hands. And guys, that's all of us. We live in a broken world, and we all have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. But in this ministry... Some of the things that I get to do, and it's a privilege to do, I get to help lead step studies. And in the step studies, it's a nine-month commitment where I've taken other ladies through the principles of recovery based on the Beatitudes. And one of the first Beatitudes is to recognize that we are spiritually poor. And people come into these meetings And it's a safe place where they can really share their stuff. And I tell you, I can sit on the edge of my chair and I've watched miracles happen. I've seen people who've had marriages that were about to fall apart. And God has repaired it. I've seen people come into the group and talk about a sexual abuse that happened when they were a child and they never, ever had spoken of it until that time in that meeting. And so they were beginning, able to begin to shed the shame and deal with the destructive behaviors because of that. I've seen people who were caught and on death's door with addiction begin to live. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And so one of the other things I get to do in this ministry is I'm a training coach, and so I helped train my leaders, the leaders in the groups, 
And one of the things that we do is we train them how to tell their story. And it's awesome. God has given each one of us a story. But sometimes we just don't know how to put it together so we can share it with the next person. And so I get the privilege of doing that. And I tell you, I absolutely love hearing their stories. And so as I'm pouring in, they're pouring back into me, and it's a beautiful, beautiful relationship. The other thing I get to do is I get to help sponsor. Right now I'm currently sponsoring four other ladies, and I love it. I learn so much about myself as I'm pouring into them, and they pour back into me. They share, me, share with me the victories that they're walking through. Just this past Thursday night, I got to hear one of my sponsees share her story from stage, and it was beautiful. The ripple effect that she is having. See, getting clean and sober is not just about being clean and sober. And it has an impact on the people around them because our addictions and our hurts, habits, and hang-ups don't only impact ourselves, but we impact the people around us. And so she was able to share that, and it was a huge ripple effect. I told her today, I said, you should be up here sharing your story because it was beautiful. And so Celebrate Recovery is an awesome ministry. For the woman in the audience that is really relating to your story and maybe having some of the same struggles that you struggled with, what are some of the keys to recovery that you would share with her today? I would share, you don't have to do it alone. Our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, one of the things that they do is that it creates a barrier. And Satan would love to have us off to the side thinking, you're the only one that has this problem. And the truth of the matter is, is that you're not alone, and you don't have to do it alone. We were never designed by God to do things alone. We need to be in community. And so, quit keeping secrets. You know, you have to kind of lay down your pride and ask for help. One of the things I was taught early in recovery is the how of the program, H-O-W. The H stands for honesty. You have to get honest with yourself. And you have to be honest with those around you. You have to be open-minded. You have to be open-minded to do things differently because your way of doing things didn't work. My scripture memory and my um, praying more and my going to church more and my whatever wasn't working. And so I had to be open to some other suggestions. But you have to do more than just be open. You have to be willing that when you ask for help, you follow through. You make the rubber meet the road. You have to be willing to follow the direction. And I'm here to say that recovery does not end this side of heaven. We live in a fallen world. And we're all going to be continuing to recover until we get to heaven. So as we close, based on your story, how would you encourage us all to believe in the power of one? Well, I will tell you that in every church that my husband and I ministered in, we shared our story. And it's risky to be vulnerable and to be transparent. There's risk involved. But I am here to tell you, it is well worth the risk. It is well worth the risk. And God took me through a refiner's process in going through recovery. And he may take you through a refiner's process. Don't jump out of the fire until he's done. Go through the process with him, and he will use that. God has a desire to use our brokenness. You know, as I read through Scripture, what I read is that he uses broken people, and that's us. So be willing to give all of yourself to him, even your brokenness, even your mess, because he can make beautiful things out of that. 
but we have to be willing to give it to him. That is our offering back to him when we give him our brokenness and our mess. And the last thing that I would share is don't quit before the miracle happens. It can be tough, but I'm telling you that if I had stopped, I wouldn't have 40 years of marriage. If I had stopped, I wouldn't have the relationship with my three children or my seven grandchildren. And I love planting seeds of who Jesus Christ is in their, my grandkids' lives. And I wouldn't have had that opportunity if I had quit. So don't give up before the miracle happens. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Shirley.